Hey, what's going on, everybody? I'm Vinny Costa, editor of Street Muscle Magazine and your host of The Rodcast, the all-encompassing car show where we talk about all things automotive. Today, I'm joined by my co-host, my co Greg Acosta, editor of Engine Labs and all-around tech guru. What's up, Greg? Hey, how you doing, Vinny? I'm all right, man. I'm all Dude, right. I think I start every show with the exact same phrase, and I, I that's not intentional. <laughs> I, I start the show... At, Always with the same intro, uh, except for right now, I just bobbled that, but that's all right. <laughs> but yeah, like I don't, I don't, I just realized like every time I say it, I'm like, damn, that's exactly what I said last time. We can do another take, man. No, no, it's, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. It's just, you, dude, you can come in with something more colorful, like, or, or, you know, throw a curveball at everyone. You know what? I'm not doing great today, Vinny. <laughs> no, but I am. That's the thing. You know what really grinds my gears? Okay, I'm not Peter Griffin. <laughs> I mean, I know I'm I'm a fat guy with glasses. I get it, but easy, I'm not Peter Griffin. Easy husky, I think is the word. <laughs> but, Stout. Uh, there you go. Oh, I like that one. That, that one sounds strong. Oh. But, uh, so we got a good show today, huh? Yeah, dude. I think uh, I think people are going to be really excited about this one because um, it's cool, and I think we're going to be able to provide some insight to our readers, listeners, and viewers. Um, so this show is going to be about how to find your first project car. I get a lot of questions, emails from our readers, um, messages from my friends. Uh, hey, you know, I got a little bit of money and I want to get a classic car or I just want to get a project car. I want to get into something cool, right? Probably have a daily driver, have something that is reliable and they don't have to mess with, but they want to get into a project car. And there invariably i always end up running down a whole list of things for people to look out for consider etc before purchasing a project car because i think a lot of people end up getting in over their heads um and you see these people all the time selling things on craigslist and marketplace that are half done because they didn't establish certain criteria early on you know what i'm saying greg and right off the bat sometimes you want to look for those guys as <laughs> yeah, definitely. I'm just saying. I mean, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but sometimes buying a half done project is a great leg up. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, before um, we get into it, maybe we should establish some talking points here. Yeah. Um, so uh, the overall episode is going to be how to find your first project car, but we're going to talk about establishing certain criteria. That includes price, distance you're willing to travel, um, age of the vehicle, mileage, make, drivetrain color, et cetera, right? Yep. So then once you have that criteria established, um, it's time to develop a, a plan, which includes a timeline for the build, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> hey, oh, you're going to laugh at this one too. A budget for the build. <laughs> what? I'm sorry, I don't know that word. What, and what is that probably word? the most fun out of all three of these, and that's the theme for the build, right? Yeah, that, that is probably the best. And then once you've established all those and you're ready to pull the trigger on something, you need to factor in what you can and cannot do as far as your skill set is concerned. Um, so we're talking about, you know, things like body work, paint, engine work, uh, electrical, interior. What are your skill sets? What do you know how to do? What don't you know how to do? And you got to be honest with all right. that stuff. It's like and you don't lie to your doctor, right? Well, exactly. But also... With the project cars, it's a good opportunity to learn some of these things. So if you're mechanically apt or, um, you know, if you have an interest in taking up one of these things like paint and body, then that might be an opportunity. Um, and we'll get into that. Yeah. Um, so I then they wouldn't want to learn to weld on a drag car, right? That's yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> I so, mean, how many videos on YouTube are there of, of something launching and the whole rear end just comes flopping out, right? Dude, um, yeah, I, I'm a big I'm a booger weld guy. Um, I'm a really good grinder. I'm not a good welder. <laughs> But uh, but anyways, um, so then uh, we'll go over some some examples of good and bad uh, project cars that people might consider or at least, um, you know, some that we found. Uh, we'll also go over some pitfalls of project car acquisition. Um, there's some shady stuff out there. There's also some stuff to watch out for that's above board. And we'll go over that. And then we'll go over a couple of our project cars um, and then. Uh, We'll wrap up by discussing um, the difference between um, building and buying. Sound good, Greg? Sounds awesome. Cool, man. So let's get into it. Um, I think uh, an important thing is um, establishing those criteria, right? So uh, for you, what's the most important thing to start with? 
what it is I want. I mean, every one of my project cars, I've pretty much known what I wanted before I started looking. Like I knew the car. Right. Um, I, I'm just, I'm thinking back to, you know, my, my black car. Um, I knew down to a three year window what I wanted. And now I know why I was so wrong for that. But, um, well, so yeah. that, that falls under, um, okay. So I guess, uh, the first thing would be, you know, a lot of people are brand, um, brand myopic. Um, and so, you know, if you're a Chevy guy, you're looking for a specific Chevy. If you're a Ford guy, I think we should base this on someone who doesn't, let's say they have, you know, um, five grand to purchase their, their project car. Right. And maybe they have a budget to build on top of that. But let's say you got five grand and you're not brand myopic at all. You're, you know, let's, for the sake of our arguments, let's say domestic. Okay. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to say being that open right off the gate or right out of the gate is probably the most dangerous. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You need, because, I mean, you are literally open to buying anything. Right. <laughs> if, but at the same time, I think, um, you know, if you're dealing with that price range, maybe you would say, okay, I want something with a V8 already. Okay. I want something that's running and driving. Um, cause condition is also a huge factor, right? Oh, absolutely. So, I think first project car should be a running vehicle. Well, exactly. Right. So, that, something that you yeah. on. so that, there's criteria number one for your per, first project car. Yeah. Something that moves under its own power. doesn't have to run great. Yes. Condition and something that runs and drives. Yeah. Um, so let's say for the sake of our argument, you want a Chevy because they're, and then this falls into how do you determine, right? So let's say you yeah. decide I want a V8. I want something classic. I want an American made automobile. Okay. So what's out there for five grand? You're not going to find a whole lot of running, driving Mopars for five grand. Yeah. You'd be hard pressed to find any Fords in good condition that are, you know, running and driving for five grand. There are more, but still. So chances are you might land on a Chevy. And I'm just speaking from my own experience. You know, I'm sure that there's people who will chime in on the comments and say, oh, I, I got my duster for three grand. And those things are out there. I'm just for our, the sake of our argument. Um, so then you need to determine, um, you know, do you care about mileage? Do you care about distance that you're going to have to travel shipping? Um, what size engine, you know, 350? Uh, do you want a big block? Do you care if it's a 305? Things like that. Does color matter? Does having a nice paint job matter? Because uh, at that price point, you know, uh, you need to consider all those things. Well, and I can tell you right now, uh, when I was looking at my Mustang, I overlooked some things because I was just so eager to get it that I really wish I hadn't. Um, I got a smoking deal and I will always be indebted to Dale for the, the you know, the deal he gave me. And he was up front. It's not like he hid anything. But, you know, the card sat in the desert for, I don't know, 12 years before I got it. And he said, the paint is bad. And I was like, I don't care about the paint. I care about the paint now. And that bothers yeah. me because I don't like caring about paint. But it bothers me now. Yeah. Um, I wish I had at least addressed it properly before it was so bad. Um, but again, you know, so so that's, don't be so quick to compromise. Exactly. I, would, I would almost even say once you make your list, go over it and, and ask in each line item, do I really want that or should I save up a little more to find the right thing? Right. And you could even, I mean, if you're really into like numbers and charts and things like that, you could even say, okay, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how much am I willing to compromise this certain bullet point and then narrow it down. And Greg and I will pull up Craigslist here in a minute and we'll show you how to narrow down your search criteria to um, to help you find those vehicles. But let's say you find your vehicle. Um, now you have to establish a plan, right? Um, what does the plan include? Well, actually, let's take a step back. Um, establishing that criteria. Um, how important is uh, distance to travel? um or ship to you craig that a hundred percent depends on the condition of the car right um because i was looking for a, a a driver not a daily driver but a driver with a mustang uh I, he was three and a half hours away and it was the middle of well end of summer 
and no AC, and he lived in the desert. So well, that was a brutal drive, but I was willing to do it because it was what I wanted. Um, in the grand scheme of things, three hour a three hour drive is really not that bad. You know, I get a lot of people um, who are who message me and they're saying, you know, I, I'm not finding anything in my area. Well, you need to start looking outside your area. I advise a lot of people, um, and a lot of my my friends and and people are here in southern or in um in California and the Southwest United States. So we kind of have it good as far as the condition of vehicles. Um, so that plays a role as well. You know, I mean, you might find a smoke and deal on a car from, you know, Montana, but then you set up shipping and it gets here and it's all rusted out in the quarters. And so you need to be able to inspect the car visually, um, or at least be in great communication with the mm -hmm. seller who can shoot very detailed photos. Because if you're looking for an early Mustang, uh, and this, this goes back to doing research beforehand, right? Knowing what vehicles have what issues like if i'm shopping for an early mustang i know those torque boxes always rust out and so that's something that i would check immediately um if i'm standing right in front of the car uh so i think that that all is tied together right distance that you're willing to travel mm -hmm. um whether or not you're going to ship a vehicle uh, and and all the homework that you do beforehand i mean and just getting into that um one of the things that I've always been a really big fan of, I've done it for people and had it done for me. Um, there's a you know car somewhere where you can't really get to it. Uh, sending someone you trust to go see it. I mean, it, it, back in my day, it was it was forums. You know, you go on and go, hey, can somebody run to, you know, you said Montana, so that's stuck in my head. So can somebody run to you know Butte and check out a car for me? Right. And of course, you know, it's, it's somebody you trust because you know them through the forum or whatever. Um, I've checked out cars for people, you know, on the East coast that, that wanted them out here. Um, yeah. that's a, and with Facebook, I mean, all these Facebook groups, it's, well, you're also so doing yourself a service already by establishing yourself in that community. Right. So let's say you're, you know, shopping for that early Ford. Well, man, there's so many Facebook groups and forums on early Fords that, you know, if you start making friends with people in those forums and you say, Hey, can you go check out this car for me? You might end up finding a smoke and deal because people post vehicles like that all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, and then another thing to consider in, in that kind of stuff, sorry, I got to take a sip of water. You're all right. But, uh, the shipping aspect, um, I don't know if you remember storage wars. I'm sorry, not storage wars, shipping wars. Uh, I don't know if I ever caught that one. Okay, that was when the 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 system U ship became really popular. Okay, because people saw it, and basically anybody with a trailer all of a sudden became a shipping company. Um, yeah, speak but, speak to that. What is okay, that? So, so U ship, it's really cool. Basically, you post up a job, so you basically would say, okay, there's a car in Montana, and I need it here in Arizona. And what are you willing to do it for? And people bid on it and they bid on it. And then at the end, somebody wins. Huh. Well, I did that to get my car from California to Arizona. Okay. Um, the first winner, I guess, you know, the bid winner, uh, canceled just flat out canceled. Hmm. Um, the second one, it was very difficult. He never, he didn't show up when, it, when he said he would either end. Uh, when he did show up, he didn't have a winch and the car wasn't running at the time. Uh, and that was one of my, one of my specifics was it has to have a winch. Um, so we ended up doing some real shady crap to get it on the trailer. <laughs> um, like I said, he, he delivered it, uh, before the house closed. So I was on like last minute phone call with the, with the house sellers saying, can they please drop this off in the driveway? I'm so sorry. Like, <laughs> but if not, where can we put it? Uh, because he didn't stick to any of the agreed upon timelines. Um, it was cheap. Like the car came back intact, not a scratch on it. Well, but there's something to be was, said for that then. Yeah. I mean, it, but it was awful. I mean, it was, it was a bad experience. I think I did not walk away from that. Well, so that's the other thing, you know, that people need to consider. Do you have a trailer? Do you have a friend that has a trailer? Do you have a winch? Do you have you found a running car? Those are all things that you need to factor in. Also, that's going to affect your budget. How much gas it's going to cost to go out there renting a trailer if you don't own one. 
all those things are things that you need to consider before pulling the trigger on a vehicle, especially if it's, you know, a, a good distance away from you. Yeah, um, and I mean, and some people aren't going to care. Some people are super flexible and the more flexible you are in getting your stuff, the cheaper it's and easier it's going to be because you can course, just yeah. hire, you know, whatever, whatever dude who, who has, you know, a, a dually and a, and a car hauler. And there you go. So um, when you got your Mustang, did you have a uh, idea in mind um, as far as uh, like mileage was concerned? I know you said that you narrowed it down to even, you know, the minutia of year, you know, like yeah. within a couple of years. Um, and I know in, in the past I've I've quibbled over mileage, uh, you know, like I don't want anything over 100,000 or, or things like that. I think that's really important, especially if you're looking at um, a newer vehicle rather than a classic vehicle. Yeah. Well, I mean, at the time it was 16 years old. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't new. It wasn't old. It's kind of in that weird in between. Right. Um, I really, when I was looking, I didn't care because I knew the engine was going to come out anyway. Right. Uh, I knew everything was going to be replaced because uh, it, it was a magazine project car. It was yeah. not, you know, I, I just wanted a good straight body, you know, good, good bones and everything else was kind of a benefit. Well, so that's the other thing that I think people need to consider, though, is, um, you know, if you're not going to worry about mileage, then are you worried about drivetrain? Do you care if it's got a straight six in it or a V6? Are you going to swap it out anyways? What about the transmission? Um, do you care if it has a manual or an automatic? Uh, do you already have possibly, you know, parts laying around that you could swap in or use on that project? Those are all things that I consider. Um, and that's why I think a lot of people end up being very, um, brand myopic because you end up with like a pile of parts. You're like, oh, well, I already have a bunch of Ford parts. Why would I buy a Chevy? You know? Yeah. Except like my storage unit that's full of parts for cars I don't own. Yeah. It's just, just, it's yeah. Um, okay. So then, uh, you know, there are other factors that you, you guys need to consider, which is, um, like I just mentioned, drivetrain, also color, uh, condition of the body, rust, things like that we've beat it to a, uh, a bloody pulp by now. Well, Russ, um, real quick. One thing about rust, rust can be the worst thing in the world or rust can be the biggest helper in your deal ever. How so? Um, if, if it's rust is scary, like flat out rust is scary, yeah. but someone, if you, if you know, you're cutting out the floor pans anyway, and you're going to put new floor pans in it and there's rust in the middle of a floor pan, wheel and deal right talk about what a big deal you know you're going to replace it anyway yeah, again exactly. this is probably not the first time buyer but then you also have to be careful because if you start seeing a little bit of rust in a structural area where there's a little bit you see they're like coyotes if you see one there's a pack of them somewhere right so if you see rust on a structural area walk away that's my i i won't mess with rust yeah you know, but you brought up a good point earlier i mean if what are you building and that that rolls right into our next talking point, which is establishing a plan. Are you building a drag car? Are you building a cruiser? Are you building a date, like something that you want to daily drive? These are all things that you need to establish beforehand, because like you said, if there's rust or if there's, um, you know, if there's already a cage in the car and you don't want a cage or you do want a cage that could either save you some money or cost you some money. Those are things that you need to consider. And if there is a cage, will it cert? Yeah, exactly. I've seen people have to cut out roll cages because they were just made out of exhaust tubing or something, you know, yeah. or they didn't cert or they were, you know, they bought a roller from 10 years ago before whatever well, the current is that, um, that kind of, uh, you know, I think maybe I have these bullet points laid out wrong then because we have establishing a plan and under that talking point, there's timeline budget and theme, maybe theme goes first before you can establish a timeline and a budget, a true timeline and budget. True. Um, but uh, yeah, so, I mean, I think that's really important. You know, what do you, are you very specific? Do you not have a, a, do you not have a clue? Those are all things that are important. You know, um, I think a lot of people probably have an idea in mind for their, their dream project car, right? Like, oh, my dad used to have a, a you know, a Ford galaxy and it was this beautiful blue color with white interior. And I want to build something like that. Right. And I so, will tell you right now, that is the quickest way to get yourself into trouble. Yeah. When you are that highly specific, as I know from experience, um, I actually, I got very, very, very lucky with mine. Uh, but you're, you've just narrowed your window. 
Yeah, but I, I think there's something to be said about being unwavering in what you want. It might oh, it might yeah. extend your your timeline. It might extend your budget. But if that's what you want, then I say be uncompromising. Oh yeah, if if you if you can afford to be uncompromising, and by that I mean both in time and money, then I absolutely would suggest you never compromise on anything. Right. But in the real world, most of us don't have the luxury of the patience. Uh, I wouldn't even say time because we all have time. But the patience, which is a real big deal, or the money. I mean, yeah, you can find the perfect car. Like just before the show, I was just browsing, you know, Cobras. I don't know why I always do that. I'm not going to buy another car. Um, but I was like, oh, perfect. 98, you know, chrome yellow Cobra. Beautiful. Looked at it. $14,000. What are you, insane? Like, well, those Cobras are still commanding a lot of money. Um, and that's a different tangent. But, but I mean, I but that's not I mean. a good point. Like that's, that's again, I'm very specific in what I'm looking for. Like, well, so that's, it, you know, you, you, you touched on something just now. You said, I don't know why I look, um, you know, I'm not going to buy another project car, but that's part of it. Right. We're always hunting. I'm not in the market for another project car, but I just got one the other day because I found a smoking deal that I, I had to. Right. Um, and we can talk about that a little bit later, but, but basically if you're if you're in the market for something and you ha are have something specific in mind, you need to be checking every day. And if you have the money, don't buy the first thing that comes along. Just keep searching until you find the right one because it'll pop up. It will. Yeah. Um, and patience. Patience is something that you will a hundred and ten percent need in any project car. Project without a doubt. You know, I mean, you have to, and that you, you touched on something else too. And that's, um, establish once you've established your budget, right? Do you have the money in hand to purchase all the parts that you're going to need to put this thing together? Or is it going to be something that you're doing paycheck to paycheck? You know, like every, every other paycheck put, you know, a couple hundred bucks toward it and save up and, and build it over time because that's going to ultimately affect your timeline. Yeah. And, and be realistic. I mean, project cars, inherently are not realistic because they're dreams they're you know we have this picture in our head of what they're going to be and uh, then i think that's one of the pitfalls that you can run into as well like you let's say it's not something that you have the money to you know spend all at once and, and stockpile all these parts and put the thing together like a model um and it's something that you're you're doing over a lengthy period of time it's easy to get distracted and sidetracked with what you're building, right? Like the theme, let's say you have something in mind and you're like, I want to build uh, a drag car, but then somewhere toward the middle of the project, you're into it, you know, a couple of years and you're like, you know what? I kind of want to build a pro touring car. And you end up sw shifting gears, costing yourself a lot of money, a lot of time and a lot of heartache. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's, you're never going to be able to, to fix that though. I mean, because if your heart changes, your heart changes. I mean, it's well, certainly, but, but I think you know, if you have <laughs> the opportunity to get all the parts at once, it makes it that much easier. Yeah, and then but, sticking to a plan. But again, that requires patience. I mean, God, I don't, I don't know if I could ever do that. I it's honestly, phones, man, don't these know. these phones that that uh, that instant gratification it has made it difficult to stay the course. But I think that's one of the things that um, we need to uh, instill in. Our fellow auto enthusiasts, you know, if you have a vision in mind, stick to that vision and build it and um, and see it through because there's more than one car. Yeah. For sure. um, OK, so uh, that then we need to factor in, you know, what you can and cannot do. You've established your criteria for the vehicle that you want. You've pulled the trigger. You, you may bought the car. You've established your timeline, your budget and the theme for the build. Now you need to consider. Well, maybe before you purchase the car, you need to consider um, what you can and can't do, uh, like body work, paint, engine work, electrical, interior, out of all those things, what do you think is the most important and the most expensive? That depends entirely on what car you get. Yeah. Um, paint is one of those things where you, you don't care about it until it's bad. Uh, and it is not cheap to have it done right. Um, right. black, a black car you better hire someone who knows what they're doing. Well, so that's the other thing too. If But you can also save yourself some money if maybe you're a pretty decent, you have some experience doing body work, you know? Mm -hmm. You can do the body work 
okay, great. You know how to weld a little bit. You can patch a little rust hole here or there. Um, you can use some filler and, and, and do it properly. Okay, cool. Now you can take your vehicle to the paint booth, the paint shop, and save yourself a ton of money on all the prep and just have them spray it. Well, see, and that that's really where it gets weird for me because prep, I hate prep. I'll spray, I'll spray the car. I don't care about that. I, I really have no problem spraying paint. It's the prep. And you can't go to a body shop and have them just prep it and then take it. You know, right. I'll pay you to prep the car and then I'm out of here. Um, so again, it's it's what you're willing to do. And I mean, if you know what you're comfortable doing, and you know what? Honestly, if you if you have an idea that you might be comfortable with something, go play with it a little bit and it, before you decide I'm good at this. Right. Because how many projects have you gotten half finished? Because somebody was like, I'm good at this. And then when it's time to actually do it, they didn't. Well, that's like when it. you find, that's when you get people selling and buying cars that have, you know, a, that much uh, Bondo on a quarter panel or something, you know, someone who thought they could do it. Mm -hmm. um, but that's also a, another good point too, right? Like it depends on where it might need that that work right so if it's a front fender or a hood or something that's dented that where you know companies are repopping these parts and you can get aftermarket fenders and hood bumper hey just bolt it right on but if it's something more difficult like a quarter panel that has a big gouge in it or you know a rusted out um roof line that's a considerable yeah. amount of work comparatively well and then also think about this when you bought snake eyes did you think you were going to have trouble finding fenders for it? Uh, yeah. So the, okay. uh, did you no, know? No, 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 I did not. I did. I did not. Sorry. I'm doing that California yeah. thing where we say, yeah, no, <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I mean that, I think that's a great example. I mean, because like we were talking the other day, even Chevy's man, like <laughs> it would it would it have changed anything you did? No. Cause I still got a smoking deal on that car. Um, and that's that's an interesting story, and we'll get into that. But but um, but to answer your question, no, I didn't consider the fenders. Um, uh, but truthfully, the fender wasn't dented when I the front fender wasn't dented. But I will tell you that the rear quarters were rusted out really bad, and that's something that almost scared me off because um, I'm not a body guy. And um, but I, I I have some buddies who do it, and so that was something that almost scared me off. But I felt confident that when the time came. Um, I'd be able to take care of it. See, I, I'm not going to lie. Rest it out. No, done. I'm yeah. out. Like that's rest scares me. And maybe it's because I haven't really messed with it personally. I haven't had to deal with it personally. And I've seen friends get really screwed by rest. I like um, them old, man. I like them old. So for me, it's like, it comes with the territory. Uh, living in the Southwest United States, you know, you get lucky sometimes. <laughs> But at this point, I mean, we're dealing with cars that are, you know, 50 years old and older. Um, you're going to have to either get good at body work or pay someone to do it. So, yeah. well, I think you, you hit the nail on the head when you said, you know, we're from the, you know, the golden zone. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's people on the East Coast listening to this just laughing at me. Yeah. I'm like, like so terrified of rust. And they're like, dude, everything has rust. Um, dude, I, I see. I see consistently like especially in the mopar community just rusted out piles going for crazy money because dude you just that's you got to deal with it you got to deal with it and if you want one you like i said you either got to do it yourself or pay someone to do it um because these cars aren't getting any younger you know what i'm saying yeah and that that's kind of the scary thing is it, they're not getting any younger and they're not like, I mean, okay, maybe Dynacorn is popping off some stuff. Yeah, but, but it's still uh, a Dynacorn body isn't there's there's just some weird like there's Dynacorn, there's real deal steel, there's a few out there, and and that's cool, you know, if you're building a race car or something, but um and I'm not a purist by any means, but I, I don't know, man. I don't know if that's a I don't know if I want to touch that. You know, I, all I'm gonna say is my opinion will be formed a hundred percent completely about how I feel about like those kind of replacement bodies when someone starts repopping Fox body Mustangs. <laughs> I mean, honestly, because then I will have a very hard decision to make. Um, I, you know, I mean, to your point, they've been doing it for a long time, you know, a deuce coupe, you can buy a fiberglass body for it right now. How long have they been popping those out a long time? So it's not anything new, 
but there is like those those early Ford guys. They if you see an all steel body cruising down the road, and it I just saw one the other day out in um, uh, Encinitas, and uh, you could see the 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 patch the patchwork that he had done repairing the body and smoothing it out, but it was an all steel body, and it was like that's pretty cool because there's a yeah. lot of fiberglass bodies floating around. Yeah, and I mean. When Dynacorn came out with their stuff, I remember seeing it and going, this is really cool. But again, early early Mustangs aren't where my passion is. That's not where my heart is. So I don't have that weird emotional connection to, to care one way or another. Yeah, but but if you were <coughs> an early Mustang guy or... Well, that's what I'm um, saying. I mean, I, I, I can give you an honest opinion when the Fox Body Mustang starts happening. Because that's speaking, where my heart if is. If they started repopping them right now, would you feel any different about owning one of those? I don't know. Over a real one. I can't honestly tell you with any kind of true moral honesty. Like I could tell you, yeah, I'd be fine with it. You know, but maybe I'm not. I, I don't know. I don't know, I, guys. Um, I, I'm having trouble finding a side here too. Drop a comment in the comment section and let us know, you know, are those quote unquote real you know, or is it something entirely different? Uh, does it matter to you guys? Let us know. Yeah. Um, but okay. we, I, I feel like we've wandered off a little bit. And that's yeah, a little bit, a little bit. But these are things <laughs> that you need to consider, right? Yeah. Um, so anyways, uh, you know, can you or can you not do body work? Can you or can you not do paint? Can you turn a wrench? Can you change spark plugs? Can you do um, basic maintenance? Because if you can do basic maintenance, chances are you can build the rest of it too. You know, you can bolt a couple fasteners together. Yeah. Um, and not, not, do you want to be able to, can you right. like, you have to be honest with yourself. Cause that's a real easy way to get in over your head. Yeah, exactly. You know, are you, um, you know, how, how much time can you dedicate to it? You know, is it just something that you do on nights and weekends? Is it something that you're going to spend a lot of time doing? Are you uh, a working professional? Are you a college student? Are you, a high school kid getting into your first project. These are all things that only you can answer, but they play a huge role. And something we haven't even touched on that just occurred to me. What's that? Are you building a project car for the end result or do you want a project car for the process? Uh, that's a great question. That's a great question. I think because for someone who wants the process, you don't want a, a good finished car. Like that's no fun for you. And by the same token if you're somebody who has a ton of money and not a lot of time you probably want something closer to be done that you can do one little thing on and be like i built the car <laughs> you know i mean i know those guys um, yeah the invited yeah, assemblers yeah i i i built the car well what would you do i changed the wheels yeah that's well great you know, that's that's an interesting point too because you know, there's, and we were going to talk, discuss this at the end, but we can jump ahead and, you know, talk about what, um, you know, is there a merit or I, I know that for me, there's a prestige of ownership when you drive something and own something that you really built, right? Like you had a grinder and a welder and, you know, you were underneath that dash for hours, splicing wires, um, you know, all those things matter. And then when you drive the car, it feels that much better. And I know as editors, we deal with, you know, feature vehicles all the time. And we talk to people about their cars all the time. And uh, for me, those stories are always like the really good ones, right? Like, yeah. oh, this was a labor of love. And, you know, I built it over X amount of time and et cetera. Yeah, well, it's, it's really funny, too, because, I mean, in theory, you shouldn't be able to pick out a home built, a well built home built vehicle from, you know, but uh, when I was up at Good Guys in Pleasanton a couple years back, uh, I was searching for some some features, and just somehow the three that I like wandered over to to you know to shoot a feature for all ended up being home built. Hmm. Like the guys built them themselves. I wasn't looking for like any kind of home built angle. I wasn't trying. I mean, it just I was drawn to their car. I I, ha I end up doing that as well, and I wonder if it's because the owner's um, personal style, their uh, you know their personality is um, personified by that car, right? Like I wonder if it shows through, and then somehow it's 
gravitational in a way. Yeah, it's it's real subtle, non cookie cutter things maybe that mm -hmm. are just slightly different, and they they catch something in your brain. It's those personal touches, you know, <clears throat> you know the guy's name embroidered on the dash pad, or um, you know what shift knob he chose to put in there and why, or how he routed his spark plug cables. I, I don't know. These are just minute yeah. things, but they, they add up to be important. And those are the things that I notice. you know, those little, those little details that make it really cool. Yeah. And, and the thing is, I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm saying don't pay somebody to do things uh, because there are certain things where you need to try to figure out how much is my time worth? Well, um, yeah, I think that's that's important, man, because, you know, these are skills that you develop over a lifetime. Um, you know, these are if you have the money and you've worked your let's say you don't know the first thing about building a car, but you've spent a long time in school and then you end up doing something, you know, you're an accountant or a banker or whatever. And that's what you do. But you have this money saved up and you have an idea in mind and you say, this is the car I want and pay someone to build it and you had the vision, I think there's credibility there too. Oh, absolutely. I mean, as long as it's yours like that. And that's, and I'm not saying, you know, that somebody that wants to go out and buy somebody else's pre-done car and just cruise around in it, that's cool. You know, it's just, it's a different, it's a different thing. Like that's I, what I think that's a different thing though. I think having a vision and having someone with the skill set to build it and, and employing that, um, I think, like I said, that's got some merit. And then oh, obviously absolutely. turning yeah. the wrenches yourself and, and doing things yourself that has even more merit, at least in my eyes. And then on the scale of things, if you just purchase someone's already done car, um, that story is a lot less interesting, you know, yeah. and, and that's, I'm just speaking, frankly, you know, people might disagree with me. If you do drop it in the comment section and let me know why, um, because there's an art to the hunt as well, just like we're describing. Um, well, I mean, and, and here, here's where I'm kind of coming from, right? Um, on my Mustang, I did a lot of things because I wasn't afraid. It was my project car. It wasn't my daily driver. Looking back, should I have been so confident completely swapping and redesigning the rear brake lines? Like, you know, I was I was talking to Rob the other day and and he made some joke about about the uh, the rear brake lines because how frustrated I got with you know bending the hard line, and I and I, I stopped for a second. I'm like, you know, it hasn't leaked. Like that surprised me. The fact that I'm surprised that my work didn't fail means I probably shouldn't have been bending and flaring my own brake lines. Like, sure, I can put the calipers on. Sure, I can do all that. Maybe I shouldn't have been doing that, but I did it and it worked. Okay, but well, like. If you're not comfortable with a safety system, like swapping your brakes, there's no shame in paying someone who knows what they're doing to do it. Right. Certainly. You know, um, I mean, and then that's also, you know, you're paying for a level of craftsmanship as well. You know, like I said, these are skills that professionals develop over a lifetime. Um, and uh, how important is it to the individual to either develop those skills or to your point, not and just pay a professional to do it. I think both have merit. Yeah. Um, so I guess, uh, yeah, I guess there's a scale, right? There's a scale, at least for me, you know, uh, people who build their cars, they get the most cred from me, people who pay someone and they have a vision to build the car. Um, and they work with a builder, maybe work with someone who can do a rendering also, um, get a lot of cred from me and people who just buy someone else's car. I guess it depends on the reason and how long they hunted for it and, and things like that. But um, it's just, it's less interesting to me. And that's just my take on it. Yeah. I mean, if, if it's somebody like, you know, he's, he's been hunting forever for the first car. He took his wife out on a date in and sure. you know, he's, he's, you know, I'm just making something up. Say he's 70 years old. He's got a ton of money in the bank. He doesn't want to bust his knuckles anymore. He did all that. He doesn't have to prove anything to anybody. But then, you know, there's a, a, a Skylark that pops up for sale and he just wants to buy it. That's a cool story. And it's like cooler. And, yet. Plus, and plus, he has earned the right to just buy it instead of having to break his knuckles. on For it. sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you got someone like that or, you know, someone who owns um, the bullet Mustang and they hunted for that, you know, like, hey, man, I can't take anything away from you. Uh, but to your point, I think 
even cooler still is the guy who never sold that car and still owns it. You know, that like still owns the car that he took his wife on their first date. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, that guy gets even more credit from me, but yeah, we're but I mean, off. not everybody's financial situation allows them. To of course, just, of course. Um, I mean, that's why it's coming all... coming from the guy who let a car sit for ooh probably four years without touching it. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> we should we should uh, forewarn people about those guys too. It's not for sale. Mm, um, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, because man, there's you know before there was Craigslist, before there was um, you know Facebook Marketplace, there were like the classifieds, and outside of that, you know you you got to go hunt. You got to drive around neighborhoods and look for old cars. And invariably you come across something that's in the weeds, but it's not for sale and it's not ever going to be for sale. And I see photos like that of these derelict cars that I'm just, <sighs> I mean, I can't even uh, remember how many times there were uh, uh, notes under the black Mustangs windshield wiper, <laughs> you know, with a phone number. And it's like, I'm not selling it. Like, you know, yeah. I'm sorry it's been sitting there for so long, but I'm not selling it. That's that's the project car gods willing you to uh, to make some progress on your car, dude. Yeah, and th- and there's times where you know that that's that's why I laugh so hard at a timeline. I mean, especially in in you know magazine project car. Um, yeah, I know that I know TV makes it look like it takes two weekends to build a car, but that's not how it works. <laughs> and no, if you're not patient, you might as well not do it for a magazine. Well, yeah, you and I are in a unique position where um, think everything that we do is tied to editorial commitments. And so, therefore, things just take twice as long, sometimes three times. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so that's a little bit different. But to your point, you need to be realistic with your timeline. And uh, nobody can answer that question except for yourself. Uh, I I think now would be a good time to show some examples of good and bad uh, project cars. Um, How about we we screen share um, and uh, take a look at some project cars that we've we've found that are both examples of good and bad. Well, I I found this example of a of a bad first project car. I'm not saying it's a bad project. I'm just saying it's it happened to be kind of local to me, and it would be a very bad uh, first project car. All right, let's see it. <laughs> I mean, twenty five hundred bucks for a sixty three Studebaker. Yeah, that, so. I mean, on paper, that sounds like a damn good deal, right? Yeah, um, it's only twenty five hundred bucks. Is it running and driving? No. <laughs> no. Okay, now I'm seeing the photo. No, it's not. Um, <laughs> so, it's, yeah, it's so, rough. Yeah, if you were in the in the market and you were hunting for something very specific, like a Studebaker, then this might be the project for you. But if you were open-ended and you were like, well, I don't, I just kind of want something interesting, something different. I think this might be appealing, but it's something that you should definitely stay away from because this is something that I'd be afraid that somebody who was not really, it hadn't, hadn't done a project car before, didn't understand, you know, what goes into it would see that and be like, Oh, it's, it's, you know, got a great body. And yes. So, and, uh, so you get sucked into this because yeah, it's only we $2,500. We need to establish right away that we're talking about someone's first project car, yeah. not a project car. We're talking about someone's first project car. And we're, we're saying that this would be a bad first project car because one, it's an oddball. It's, mm-hmm. uh, you know, yeah. it's a Studebaker finding parts for it would be uh, relatively difficult. Um, it's also not running and driving, uh, and it looks to be a pretty solid car. But I see some surface rust that might be more than might be structural. Well, I mean, um, look, look at the frame. Yeah. So exactly. Uh, like it kind of worries me that they have a picture. I, I'm wondering if this is just a, a separate frame. Yeah, it's probably for parts. And then they, yeah. you know, they showed some pictures of the engine and stuff, and it's yeah. like I would be worried that that thing wouldn't even rotate. Mm-hmm. You know, it might, the whole thing might be seized and, you know, there's no way of knowing without, you know, putting a, putting a link <laughs> on it. But the point is this would be a car that you could easily get in over your head with. And, and you know, I know something really funny, Vinny. What's that? The more I look at it, the more I like it. <laughs> Seriously. I'm like, I'm like, that's pretty cool. Well, that's a pitfall, right? The more yeah. you look at something, the more you envision like, Ooh, I could do this and I could do that. 
but you got to know when to, you know, what's good and what's not. And you do that with the criteria that we mentioned before. Yeah. And I honestly, this would be something that in my current, you know, where I'm living and, and, you know, my driveway space and, and all that stuff, this would just be a no go, not okay. no way in hell. Even, even with, you know, if it was a magazine car, no way in hell would that, would I really honestly ever say yes to something this detailed okay. right now. So conversely, I'd like to share this with you. Uh, and I think this is probably a, a good example. Um, uh, let's see. Here we go. Am I currently sharing? It's popping up now. There we go. Is that up on screen? Yep. Okay. So we got a 70 Chevy El Camino, right? It's a little bit higher price, but if that's in your price range, then I think this would be a great pro uh, great project car because it's got some good bones. First of all, it's a 70, which happens to be, you know, one of the most popular um, uh, iterations of the Chevelle or the Chevelle and El Camino. Uh, you got the four headlights up front and it's the only year. And those are things that I know because I happen to be in the industry, but it might be worth doing research on which front end do you like the best? Um, and then not only that, but, uh, you know, it seems to be in relatively good shape, but then you get here and we got a 350 V8 crate engine, the most prevalent, you know, hot rod engine of all time before the LS, of course. Uh, and it looks like it's got a little blower on it. Um, it's got some speed parts on it. Uh, you know, no way of knowing if that engine is any good or if it's toast or whatever uh, without actually going and inspecting it. But the point is, it's got good bones. Um, and you could probably build a pretty cool hot rod out of this thing with minimal, minimal work. And I think for a first project car this might be a little bit expensive but if you could come up and maybe haggle with them and get them to come down this would be a, a good first project yeah like i'm i'm looking at this car and the only red flag right off the bat is going to be been sitting since 2017 exactly so it's like well then put a new battery in it and start it for me i mean and that's that's just you know sitting a run a big phrase that you need to be really wary of is uh ran when parked yeah okay then it better run now like <laughs> right so um, and then you know you got uh, down here at the bottom it says engine and transmission rebuilt along with the supercharger so to your point it should start up mm -hmm. and you um, know what if this seller is serious he can find a battery i mean even if it's just you know uh, out of his daily driver to jump start it um if it if it runs then it runs but right. they they should be able to prove that to you. And um, and and if you get there, then that could be how you get them to come down on the price, right? Like if it's having trouble starting, but you kind of know, oh, well, maybe the carb needs to be cleaned or, oh, well, you know, this fuel filter looks like a little bit clogged. That could work in your favor. Um, you know, uh, I have the mechanical aptitude to say, I can get this thing to run if I get it home. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and another thing to think about too, I mean look at the car let's let's play worst case scenario right now okay you get it you get in over your head will you get your money back out of it that's the that's the other uh that's another huge deciding factor for myself before i pull the trigger on any project i need to get it for a price where i will in, indefinitely make my money back if i need to sell it yeah i mean i'm looking at this and 6800 seems a little steep just it's for a me. little, it's a little on the high side, but it's got a blower. It's got some cool speed parts. The body looks like it's in relatively good shape. It was painted sometime in the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so I, I, there's money to be there. Even if you part the car out, like I, I would said, look at it. I mean, if, honestly, this car, I would go look and you know yeah. what, if your budget is $5,000, I think about trying to come up with another 18. Certainly. Yeah. This, um, this looks like a good solid, especially if it does run. You know what I mean? I mean, at least if it can get onto a trailer by itself. This would be a smoking deal. I would I would certainly go check it out if I was in the market. And um, yeah, I, I think that someone who bought this car, they would have no problem either flipping it or making a really solid car out of it. But that's that to me is a good example. Yeah. And I mean, and you know what? Yeah. Nobody looking for the first project car is going to be thinking about flipping their car or whatever. Exactly. I don't think. But you do need to think 
financially, if this goes south, can I get my money back? Right. I mean, because you know what? You can you can bid with your heart. You can get on some eBay three-way you know, uh, bidding war, and you can overpay and get exactly the project you want, and you just realize that if you ever have to sell it, you're going to lose, you know, I, uh, I think, you know, obviously those are, those are all things that you need to, um, do research on and decide for yourself before you get into this. But, um, uh, that to me, um, it's a good example. Uh, yeah. Just depends on your, your situation. But, um, uh, that kind of, uh, helps me. It's, it's interesting cause I, I, I just happened to find this El Camino in my area. Um, but I, I just picked up an El Camino as I mentioned to you last week, Greg. Um, and it's funny because you were asking about snake eyes before I'll throw up some photos. Um, uh, let's see here. So you asked about snake eyes and, you know, I came to own that car in a pretty interesting way. Um, I was in the market for an El Camino. I've always wanted an El Camino and, um, and, uh, I found this Monte Carlo on, on Craigslist, uh, years ago. And this is the way that I got it when I got it. Um, and it just so happened to, uh, you know, catch my eye. It had some cool speed parts on it and it had a little bit of attitude. It had like some cool wheels and, um, you know, I got it for a smoking deal. Uh, I got it for a really good price. I bought it for like three grand and it was running and driving. I drove it from Ontario, California, all the way back down to Bakersfield, California. And, um, uh, but to your point, Greg, I, I drove it for about a year um, off and on. It wasn't exactly my daily, but I, I drove it quite a bit and um, uh, ended up um, developing a knock and the the block had a had a crack in it, um, which is when I ended up swapping in the 383. But uh, but I still came out on top because I purchased the car initially for a good price and I saved it. And so now uh, I'll show some photos of it updated here. Um, take this one down and we'll throw this one up. I'm not going to lie. And this is going to piss you off. I like that orange. Oh, dude. I, I, so I had plans on painting it orange uh, for a really long time, but then I rattle canned it black and I just, it, it took on a, personality and now it's i mean it looks great i do I, i'm a fan of like the matte black the you know yeah we're we have a paint and body segment story that we're going to be um doing here pretty soon uh but it's fear not readers and viewers it's going to stay matte black but we're going to do it the proper way this time not with rattle cans <laughs> uh but but anyways so you know fast forward like five six years and you know this is the project product excuse me, the progress that we've made, right? So it's got a 383 with a new transmission, a blower on it, new interior, um, a lot of really cool speed parts underneath. It's got all new suspension, wheels and uh, tires, new brakes. I mean, the thing's a monster now. Um, it still looks ratty as hell, but uh, it's got a whole new life underneath those body panels. And it's taken me a really long time, Con you know, comparatively to some. I but, mean, uh, but that that's that's part of the project. I mean, how how upsetting would it be if you had a project that only lasted you six or seven months? That'd be awesome. I mean, well, at that point, <laughs> you'd be in you'd be in business. There's no way you're you're working full time and completing a project in six months. Yeah, that's a good point. But I mean, for me, a lot of project car journey is the journey. Um, just the same way, you know, when a uh, long running TV show ends or a, a book that I'm reading, you know, it, I'm at the end of it, you know, that kind of, that kind of sad feeling. Cause it's over. That's kind of what I feel at the end of a project. It's kind of like, Oh, okay. It's over. That kind of sucks. Yes. And no, I agree with that because you're, then you get to enjoy it. You get to enjoy the fruits of your labor. You know, um, this, uh, this project has come to fruition and now you get to uh, you get to cruise it. Yeah. Um, well, and then you run into things like with the with the black car after sitting for four years. I finally got it running again, and all of a sudden I was like, absolutely not! I'm not turning it into a race car. I just want to drive it because um, I missed it. You know. Well, that's that was the point that I was making earlier. You know, don't try try your best not to waver on what you want to build, what you want that theme to be, because you're going to end up causing yourself a lot of headaches. Um, and also, I think it's important. Uh, 
don't give up. You know, if you're if you're looking for something specific, do not give up because, you know, five, I think five going on six years later, I finally found that El Camino that I was hunting for. Mm -hmm. And I was in the right place at the right time. And I had the money and I had to pull the trigger because it was something that I've been wanting for a really long time. I have resources and and I did it. So I'll, I'll show you guys um, a photo of it here. Well, I mean, and, and to the end of always look, um, it was, I want to say it was like Friday or Saturday. Um, there was a, a Fox body that popped up, right? Um, and it was really cheap. And it was from one of my Mustang friends. The first thing I said was, why is it so cheap? And I will be out there in six hours. And then it was, you know. Everybody's like, dude, read the ad. It had left <laughs> off at zero. And I was like, really? oh, yeah, yeah. For some reason, Facebook had listed it as $1,850 instead oh, of yeah, eighteen yeah. five. And I mean, I was literally like, I told I told Jamie, I said, I'm going to the bank. I'm pulling out some money, and we're going to have another car in the driveway. Sorry. Well, um, and she was like, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. At that price, of course. Well, um, yeah, dude, it's easy to get duped, you know? Um it's, I know a lot of people that it's happened to my old man. He, um, he was in the market for a Mustang, a fastback, a 69 or a 70. And he found a, a great deal. It just happened to be, um, this guy in Canada was selling it. And looking back, there was a lot of red flags. Right. Um, and he went so, so far as to, you know, send the guy a deposit. And luckily he contacted his bank before, um, they were able to access that money. But I mean, there are those scammers out there, man. And we can talk about that right now, but but right now, I just wanted to show this Elko. I got it for a smoking deal. It's got a 350 engine, 350 trans. Um, it's got good bones, uh, relatively rust-free. There's a little bit in the front uh, fenders at the bottom. Um, but I got it for a smoking deal, 2,900 bucks, running and driving. So, um, that's, so I mean, they're that's... out there, you guys. They are out there. That's a 71. Um, I found that one hiding in, in uh, at a tow yard in Bakersfield, California. So the deals are out there. You got to, you got to hunt and find them. Um, but they're out there. Yeah. And I mean, and, and that's another thing, do your due diligence when you find a deal. Um, unless it is literally just so good, you don't care, but then if, if it's so good that you ignore every red flag, then it's probably stolen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I well, mean, yeah. to your point, you know, um, you had brought that up earlier and that was that, uh, you know, there are pitfalls. There are pitfalls. And uh, I think it's important that we discuss some of those. Um, yeah. I mean, and, and that's the thing. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of just really shady stuff that happens in, in the automotive world. And, uh, you know, I mean, in the domestic, you know, stuff, yeah, maybe it's not as, as prevalent. Uh, but I would say if you're living anywhere near the border, either Canada or, you know, Mexico, yeah, it's a smoking deal, but when you start getting hit with some of that import stuff, like, I mean, from from the import side of things, I know there's a lot of Japanese cars that you couldn't get in the U.S. that you can physically get across the border from Canada. Right. And there's a lot of really shady, like, VIN tampering that happens. Um, to that end, I found... Yeah, yeah, wanted... throw that up. I okay. want to see what you were talking about. Okay, so I found this wanted to buy ad. Okay. Um, let's, let's be honest. Nobody Ooh, wants a nine project or I've always been wanting yeah. Greg. Nobody, nobody is dying to get a 93 to 96 four door Mirage. It has to be what four you, doors. Bro. What are you talking about? I would kill for a four door Mirage. Yeah. There, there is one way where this is legit. And that's if the guy is just looking to clone an Evo. Okay. Realistically, he's probably going to take the VIN and put it on a gray market car so that he can register it in the U S because a 93 to 96. What do you mean? mean Gray market? uh, Well, that would be like coming down from Canada because uh, a 93 to 96 Mirage is the same body chassis, you know, and stuff as a 93 to 96 Mitsubishi Lancer Evo in Japan. Uh, You couldn't bring them over. They have, you know, I mean, and now we're getting into the 25 year thing. So things are changing. Uh, but this is why it's important to do your due diligence. Yeah. And I mean, and, and the Japanese car, again, most of the audience probably doesn't give two craps about Japanese imports like, like this, but I, I've seen it a lot and it's, you know, 
it's something shady is going on here is my gut feeling. Maybe, maybe the guy is literally just looking to make a clone. I mean, granted 93 to 96, he's only got what another year before the 25 year rule hits. What do you mean? If it, uh, after 25 years, there's an, uh, uh, safety, you know, NH national highway traffic safety administration, whatever about airbags and stuff. So there's like a rolling 25 year import thing. And once it hits 25 years, it doesn't have to meet the, the crash safety and stuff like that. Okay. So like right now, 25 years is 95, right? Did mm-hmm. I do the math? Yeah. So basically a 1995, a car manufactured in Japan as of this date, 1995 or older can be imported without worrying about converting it to modern standards. Right. Uh, well, if, if you just had to have a 1996 and you could drive it down from, you know, from Canada, because that's kind of the gray market, and then you have this car, you could register it under that VIN. And now all of a sudden your Evo on paper is just a Mitsubishi Mirage that's, you know, legally mm. uh, registered in the U.S. Yeah, man. See, that's, I. you got to um, do your research and know things like that, right? Like, so... I wasn't aware that this Mitsubishi Mirage and the Evo shared so much in common. Yeah. And I mean, and that's the thing again, like I said, our, our listeners probably don't care, but it's just, it's really interesting to, th- to see. And nobody looking at this is going to go, Hey, that's a scam. Well, I know that, um, and this is kind of a, a different story, but it's still interesting. And it, it plays to your, um, your point. There's a guy, uh, we actually published a story on it on streetmusclemag.com. I'll try and find it and drop the link in the comment section. But it was about um, this this famous van, right? Uh, you know, I love vans. Mm-hmm. And it's um, it was like a 71 or 72 uh, Chevy van. It was a shorty. And it was famous because it was in this movie Van Nuys Boulevard. And it was shown cruising. And it was called the Wild Cherry Van. And um, some people... Uh, Purchased or they owned the van back then in the 70s when the film was made, and uh, they owned some property somewhere here in uh, central or southern California. Um, and so it was on private property, but it was uh, like wrecked, and uh, at some point, a tree had fallen on it and crushed it. And um, interestingly enough, some hikers posted a photo of the van, a guy out in Texas, I believe. Um, saw the photo, recognized the van. He and he was a vanner. So he said, Ooh, that's a cool van. I'm going to go get it because in the photo, it seemed that it was on public property. So he goes over, gets the van, uh, actually finds that it's behind a locked gate. So he finds a sheriff in the area and asks the sheriff, um, to open the gate. And the sheriff actually, uh, did he opened the gate for him because he thought it, he also thought it was private, uh, uh public land. Um, and I think that the, the guy who took the van was masquerading as someone who was maybe there to, you know, relocate the van or, or, or whatever, you know? Yeah. And, um, so anyways, he ends up taking it back to wherever he's from. I think I want to say Texas, um, and swapping the vins and restoring the van. So he got the van from another classic van, swapped it and restored the van. Well, he's all over the internet for restoring this van. Like, oh yeah, look at this guy. He restored the wild cherry van. People loved it. Well, the owners, the prior owners, um, they contacted him and they said, hey, that's our van. You stole our van from our property. That's private property here in California. You came and took our van. So they got all tied up in legislation, um, you know, just fighting it out in the court. Um, I believe he still owns the van, but he had to pay them what the judge deemed it to be worth, which was probably way more than it was actually worth. Uh, but it's not the point, you know, he took somebody else's van. Yeah. Um, and of course they, you know, they told the whole sob story. Oh, we were going to rebuild it. They were never going to rebuild it. Um, but to your point, there's some shady stuff out there and people have to know, right? Yeah, so man. do your and own I mean, work, pay attention. Just, just remember one thing. If it's valuable enough for somebody to want it, it's valuable enough for somebody to counterfeit it. And right. that, that goes for anything cars, you know, sneakers. Uh, I'm just trying to think of stuff. You can, you can see counterfeit stuff on, on eBay. Um, but you gotta be careful. And I mean, granted, most people shopping for their first car aren't going to care about some, you know, special thing. 
But, I mean, if you go to look at the thing and everything else is nasty and there's this beautiful brand new VIN plate on it. Something could be shady going on, man. Yeah, and and do you really want the police knocking on your door after you've put three years into it? Because, exactly you know, somebody, and it's happened. Oh, it has happened. Um, it's not yours at that point. Like, right. you, it doesn't matter what your intentions were when you paid for it. You know, you didn't know it was stolen, but you're the one. And and we're maybe not getting into um, just project cars. This is buying any car, Uh, but check the VINs. Uh, Make sure that the the door tag matches the dash, matches the um, underhood. It's something simple, but that a lot of people overlook. Mm -hmm. Check those VINs, man. Make sure they match. Yeah. I mean, it it would really suck for your first car for you to have such a bad experience that you never bought another project. Yeah. Those are just I mean, some of the pitfalls that you can run into. Um, and uh, I think those are important to, to touch on. Yeah. And remember at the end of the day, this, this, all this stuff is supposed to be fun. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean this, if it's so, not fun, maybe, maybe don't do it. <laughs> well, just to recap everybody, um, how to find your first project car. You need to establish criteria, what you are unwavering on. That includes price distance. You're willing to travel or ship age of the vehicle mileage, uh, make and model, drivetrain, color, and the list goes on and on. Um, Once you've done that, you need to establish a plan that includes a timeline, a budget, and a theme for that build. Once you've done that, uh, you need to factor in what, uh, what, what work you're willing to do or capable of doing on the project car itself. That includes, you know, paint and body, um, engine work, electrical, things like that. Um, and then, uh, from there you need to be wary of some of the pitfalls that Greg and I discussed, which include, you know, shady practices by the seller and, um, you know, rust and things like that. And lastly, just have fun with your projects, man. Yeah. And and my, my biggest thing is just be honest with yourself. And if you want a rusted out 20 year project, cool. Like if that, if that's your thing rock on like you, you go out there and you know you turn one bolt every two months cool if that's what you're into rock on yeah. just just be realistic and be honest with yourself yeah. you know there's a there's something to be said for someone who can dedicate and stick to a, a project and see it through to the end um i really love it uh there's not a whole lot of activities that i enjoy more um than than actually turning wrenches on my car. It's a lot of fun and fulfilling, rewarding, all those things. Um, before we sign off, Greg, uh, is there anything um, that you'd like to say to the readers about what's going on with Engine Labs, um, projects that you have coming up, uh, anything like that? Uh, well, by the time you hear this, uh, Engine Labs will have a cool thing up on, I, I bear with me here, um, the new Chevrolet L3B. Did I say that right? Anyway, it's it's a 2.7 liter four cylinder with a crazy new turbo on it. Um, mm. It's it's in the uh, Cadillac CT4 V. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's kind of funny. Um, it started out as a truck engine. GM was very much it's a truck engine, truck engine, truck engine, and then it ends up in a sports sedan. Of course. Okay. Like all the three <laughs> but, but it's got it's got this cool thing called a uh, a dual volume turbo so it's it's not quite a twin scroll because it's on top of each other instead of next to each other Hmm. cool article uh just go go check it out it's interesting fun um i know four cylinder is gonna make everybody go yeah right whatever it's cool technology uh yeah and then uh next tuesday we have a ten thousand rpm ls uh engine built as a teaching tool going live very cool. So that that so next Tuesday, go check that out. Uh, that'll That's be awesome. live then. Very cool. Um, as for Street Muscle, uh, today we just published a really cool feature about a uh, a '69 Roadrunner. Uh, really beautiful car. Uh, gentleman built it over uh, a lengthy period of time, um, but uh, that that falls right in line with what we talked about today. It was a project. It was a labor of love, and the guy. He knew what he wanted out of the car, and um, and he spent that time and money building that car, and it shows. So go ahead, go check that one out. 
Um, we also published last, uh, I think on Monday, um, the first uh, article in the series of um, uh, the van, uh, the van build. So that's pretty cool. Go check that out. And uh, other than that, you know, we're going to keep cranking out the same hard hitting content like we always do. Um, you can find Greg and I uh, back here next week at uh, 12 p.m. California time. And um, this has been fun, Greg. Thank you, man. Yeah, for sure. It's it's a good. I wish I wish I had seen this, you know, before I started building project cars. Um, I just wish somebody had slapped me in the head on the paint thing. That is yeah. probably my biggest regret right now uh, because I do not want to spend the money to have the car repainted, but it needs it. And it's my fault. For our yeah. viewers and, and listeners and readers, um, drop a comment in the comment section. Let us know about your project cars, uh, things that you wish that you would have known beforehand, things that uh, you, um, you, you know now and you would never make that mistake again, et cetera. Uh, let us know if this helped you. Let us know if you guys want more content like this. And uh, we'll see you here next week. Greg, it was a pleasure, man. Always a pleasure. See you next yeah. week.